Hello, I want to spend some time today talking about modern infrastructure automation. I think when we talk about infrastructure automation today, a lot has changed about what we consider sort of best practice, right? In HashiCorp's view, I think there's kind of two core tenets uh, that we believe in. One is this notion of infrastructure as code, right? And when we talk about infrastructure as code, it's the idea that we're going to capture all the aspects of the process of managing our infrastructure, defining it, configuring it, et cetera, in a codified way. And then that allows us to automate against it, apply version control, et cetera, get all these great benefits. The other big one is this notion of immutability, right? And with an immutable approach, what we're doing is we're baking sort of images or artifacts that are versioned. And then when we need to make changes, instead of trying to upgrade our infrastructure in place, we bake a new version of that image, right? So we go from version one to version two, and we upgrade to them atomically rather than trying to in place migrate. And I think ultimately, if we kind of zoom out, you know, why do we care about these two approaches, right? Really what it's about is how do we manage complexity? How do we manage risk, right? And how do we go quickly? By virtue of capturing things as infrastructure as code, right? Now we can automate the standup and provisioning of that infrastructure. And so that allows us to go a lot faster. We can repeatedly stand up and provision new infrastructure and stamp it out without manually having to point and click and reconfigure it each time, right? So that allows us to go fast, but because it's machine automated, it eliminates human error, right? So this is where we start to reduce that risk, right? And from a complexity viewpoint, each of these sort of deviations, even if they don't fail, start to create sort of special snowflakes of infrastructure. If we provide you know, 50 servers that we manually provisioned, all 50 might be slightly different, right? So we've introduced a bunch of accidental complexity to our infrastructure versus if all 50 were identically the same, right? And then immutability is sort of a same concept, right? It simplifies it where we don't have to think about these 50 different web servers that are slightly different in their configuration. We maybe have 40 that are running version one and we have 10 that are running version two. And so we can think about it in this discrete way that simplifies the complexity, but also reduces the risk that things break in unpredictable ways, right? If we're installing packages and running configuration management at runtime, right? The risk is that those things could fail, right? In ways that we didn't expect. And so that introduces different risks uh, that we don't have in an immutable world where we move towards really it's atomically, did it boot or did it not boot, right? So it reduces and simplifies the problem space. So how do we realistically apply this, right? In our view, there's sort of three different areas where we'd apply the HashiCorp tooling. The first is with Packer. So Packer looks at really how do we start by building a Packer configuration file, right? So we define through a set of infrastructure as code configuration, what are all of the inputs, right, that we need? So this might be source code, it might be configuration management tooling, it might be various sort of security controls, maybe compliance controls that we care about, et cetera. So we'll define all of these things as sort of the inputs to our Packer file, right? All of the components that we need. And then what Packer will do, we feed this into Packer itself. And then Packer's job is ultimately to generate for us an artifact, right? And this artifact can vary, right? The goal of Packer is that we have a common workflow but ultimately you can generate a whole bunch of different things, right? So this could be, for example, a VM image. It could be, you know, an AMI in the cloud, right, on Amazon. This could be a Docker container, right? The list sort of goes on. In some sense, we don't actually care what the artifact is. We just care that we have a consistent process of translating sort of this input of source code and configuration management through a repeatable sort of process where we build these image and ultimately, we'd probably land it into some sort of artifact management store, right? So maybe this goes into something like Artifactory as an example, right? So if, let's just say well, this is a web server that we're building. We're going to define our source code and our config. We're going to go through this process and ultimately end up with, you know, let's say version one, right? And this might be a Docker container that lands in the sort of artifact store, right? Or it might be a machine image. Next is Terraform, right? And so you're gonna to start to notice there's a sort of a recurring pattern here, which is what it starts with is infrastructure as code. So again, we're gonna take this infrastructure as code definition of what are all of the pieces of my infrastructure that I care about, right? So I might need a load balancer that goes to a set of you know, web servers that talks to a database as an example, right? So I'm gonna declare that you know, through my infrastructure as code definition, 
that I have some infrastructure layout that looks like this, right? And then great, I'm gonna feed that into Terraform. And you're gonna notice there's a pattern here, which is Terraform doesn't care. Again, am I talking to AWS, Google, Azure, VMware on-premise, etc. Sort of doesn't matter to Terraform. It can handle all of these different environments, right? So AWS, GCP, Azure, VMware on, you know, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Terraform supports, I think, you know, hundreds of different providers. But ultimately, it's going to go out and create that sort of infrastructure, right? And so the way these things might be paired together is as part of this configuration, we say, great, I want to deploy this version one of my web server using this image that we have, right? So these three web servers that come up, right? Web server one through web server three are all running version one, right? And so this becomes great. We've now had built our immutable image. We've used Terraform it's using infrastructure as code to deploy and define how those things go out, right? And then where console actually fits into this is how do we pair this infrastructure, right, which might be dynamic and we'll see over time, with things like our load balancers, right? So again, what we might want to do is we're going to define using Terraform actually. So we'll define with Terraform with an infrastructure as code approach and say, great, what I care about is in this case, you know, my set of web servers, right? Uh, that are coming in, and I'm going to define using Terraform how that should go out and configure. In this case, you know, this load balancer might be, you know, my F5 big IP, right? And so what happens is how these things are then all integrated is I can have an image building pipeline that uses Packer, right? So great. Now I have version two of my source code. This gets modified as an example. I rerun Packer, and when it goes through, it's gonna now pick up the new source code, the existing configuration, security controls, et cetera. And now we might build this sort of V2 artifact image, right? And then great, we decide that's actually what we wanna deploy instead of V1. So we make a change with Terraform. Terraform, when we run its plan, will tell us, great, you have an existing set of VMs, right? So these set, that you have that I've already provisioned, those will need to be destroyed. And in favor of them, we're gonna create a new set, right? a replacement set, that now these will run V2. right? So Terraform by default takes this very immutable driven approach to infrastructure. When you make this change, it's not gonna try and upgrade those web servers in place. It's gonna create a new set and replace them with the old set. Or I'm sorry, replace the old set with the new set. And then the interaction becomes along the way, this might not be atomic, right? We have to first bring up the new version twos. They're gonna operate at a different set of IPs, right? And then as we feel comfortable about that, we'll tear down sort of the version one things. And so then the interaction along the way and how console integrates with this is now that we've defined this as code, right? So console operates in runtime, right? It's a runtime service. The first thing it does is it has this sort of bird's eye view of all of the applications, right? So when we had a kind of web server one, two, and three, web server three, they were all registered with console. And then when basically based on this infrastructure as code definition, the fact that it was subscribed to the set of web servers, right? Console would trigger Terraform and say, great, web server one, two, and three exist. Terraform went and then configured the load balancer to say, great, these are the three web servers that should sit behind the load balancer, right? So now as Terraform is executing and we bring up these new version two instances, right? So now this is, you know, web one prime, right? Web two prime, web three prime. These get registered with console, right? Console will then re-execute Terraform because of the set of web servers has changed. We'll update the firewall and add, or the load balancer in this case, and add the additional three instances to it. And then when Terraform destroys these three and they get deregistered from console, again, we'll execute Terraform, update the load balancer, and remove the old three that we had, right? And so this starts to show you how we can kind of pair these different technologies together into sort of a modern way of doing provisioning, right? Historically, what you would have had is you know, a manual build process where you built a golden image and rev that maybe once a quarter. Now we can bake Packer into a continuous integration system 
And so anytime we have a change in the source code or the configuration management, we can rerun and rebuild basically those core images. Then with Terraform, we can define our infrastructure and reference these different versions that we need. And so as we make changes over time, Terraform can evolve that and we can apply both the infrastructure as code best practice, but also Terraform operates in this sort of immutable way, right? It's not gonna try and upgrade these things in place. It's gonna do this in an immutable fashion and try and create new resources and destroy the old ones. In this example, I use sort of a VM type scenario, but it could be the same thing if you're using Terraform to define a workload, for example, running on top of Kubernetes, right? So we might be defining a deployment or a set of pods on top of Kubernetes same sort of a thing though, we would create the new deployment running the new version, make sure that succeeds, and then tear down the old one. So still applying the sort of immutable upgrade methodology. And then as we bring that to networking, what we often see is that networking changes tend to be behind a ticket queue. You deploy your new application, and then you file a ticket for someone to update the firewall, the load balancer, the API gateway, etc. So the idea here is that can we split this, right? And so your API really becomes as an application, what you're doing is you're publishing anytime you deploy a new instance of your application, right? So console knows, great, there's a new web server running at this IP. And then what it enables is that as a networking operations team or as a sort of a, a network team, that we can subscribe to those changes in an automated way. We can define what happens and say, every time you see a change to the, to the web server, here's how that should be reflected to, uh, for example, in this case, the uh, load balancer. But it could just as well be that we say, great, we're gonna use Terraform to update you know, our Palo Alto firewall as an example, right? So we might have a you know, Palo Alto firewall and say, great, anytime you see a new web server show up, update the firewall and allow that web server to talk to the database, right? So in this case, what we're trying to do is move away from manually filing tickets to update our network and really think about a modern infrastructure automation that's end to end, right? It's everything from how does the network get updated and reconfigured? How do we think about the underlying infrastructure that the applications are running on? And then even at the application layer, how do those things get defined, packaged, and deployed on top, right? And that can be using modern platforms like Nomad and Kubernetes, could be a serverless environment, could be VMs uh, in a more traditional architecture. But it's really about thinking about that end-to-end -end experience of network, infrastructure, application, and really applying these best practices of infrastructure as code and immutability, right? So hopefully this gives you a sense of how Packer, Terraform, and Consul can be used in conjunction for that.